Hello everyone and welcome to another video. So today I wanted to have a quick discussion on linear transformations and linear systems. So as we continue our discussion and study of ordinary differential equations, you're going to hear this adjective linear thrown around all over the place, right? You're going to hear things like linear systems, linear controllers, this is a linear mapping, all that kind of stuff. And it might be good to actually pump the brakes a little bit and ask ourselves, what does it really mean when we're talking about a linear system or a linear transformation? So let's start off with that. Let's start off with the sterile mathematical discussion and definition of a linear transformation. Sometimes you'll also hear this referred to as like a linear mapping or a linear function. So the formal definition of this is, I've written it right here, right? So a transformation L, so this is what we're asking about, this mapping or this transformation or this function L, which basically goes from some linear space X into a linear space Y. And in this case, both X and Y have the same scalar field F. Well, this mapping or transformation L is said to be linear if um, two things occur. So the first property that has to happen is this. It's L of alpha W is equal to alpha times L of W for every scalar in this field and for every potential W that is in the input space X, okay? So this property is known as homogeneity, okay? The second property that has to be true for this operator L to be a linear operator is this. If you take L of W plus P, that should equal L of W plus L of P for any possible combinations of W and P that are in the input space x. So this is known as the additivity property, okay? So again, this is the formal definition. And again, if you're not comfortable with this idea of what is a linear space or what is a, a field, um, don't worry about that too much. This concept is actually really pretty darn simple. So really, the way we can visualize this is, again, all you've got is you can think about this L. It's basically a function, right? Or a mapping which takes in something from the input space X and it maps it to some output space Y, okay? So again, sometimes you'll see this written as L maps from X to Y, right? So the picture that goes along with this is actually really simple. You can think about it, it's just, it's just some black box, it's some operation, it's some transformation or function. You stick something in, you get something out, right? So let's take a look at this picture. What might the picture look like for um, homogeneity, right? So what we've got here is some set of input spaces, let's call this X, right? So you pick something here, you pick anything in this input space X and you jam it into the function L, right? What this function L is gonna do is it's going to map you to some other space Y, right? That's all we're doing, right? That's all this function does. You pick some X, run it through the function, it generates some output Y, right? That's all this thing does. Now the question is, for homogeneity, it says, okay, let's go ahead and pick some point here, let's call this thing W, right? You pick some random W inside this space X, right? So we have to do this for every possible W inside X. And the idea is now, if you multiply W by some scalar alpha, right? What happens? That just takes you to some other location in the input space, right? So now you, this point down here is alpha W, right? Would everyone agree? That's all you're doing. You take this input, you scale it up by alpha, you just get another type of input, right? Now, what you wanna do is map this here over with L, right? So where does this take you? This takes you to L of alpha W, right? Right, all you did was you ran alpha W through the function L that takes you over here, right? Now the idea with homogeneity is you can get to this same spot if first you just mapped W over with L, takes you to this point. This is the point of L of W, right? And now what you do is on the output side, you take this number and you then multiply or scale by alpha and you end up in the same spot, right? So this is the picture that goes along with homogeneity, right? It just says you do this for any possible combination of W and any possible combination of alpha and you'll always have this property where it basically it doesn't matter if you scale by alpha first before you run it through the function or you run W through the function and then scale by alpha. In either case, it, it doesn't matter, right? If that is true, if homogeneity um, checks out, that's half of the battle, right? Let's go ahead and how about ask ourselves the same question. Let's draw the picture for um, additivity, 
right? So this is the same idea, it's very similar. Let's go ahead and get ourselves an input space X and an output space Y, right? And now what we've got to do in this case is we've got to pick two points in the input space. So pick a W and a P, right? Okay, now what this says is, let's look at the left side. How do we get this left side? Well, it says first what you do is you add W and P together, okay? So you add this to this, it takes you to some other point in the space. I don't know, let's call it down here. This is W plus P, right? You add these two together, you get this. So maybe for the interest of uh, clarity, let's just say, I'm going to make a little bit of a note here, right? You add these together and get this, right? You get that point. Then what you do with this new point W plus P is then you map it with L, right? Then you run it through the function L, okay? This takes you to this point over here in the output space. This is L of W plus P, right? Okay? Now, that should be the same as if we had come over here first. Let's look at the right side. Let's just evaluate this term, L of W. So you just take only W by itself, run it through the function, right? That's going to take you, who knows, over here, right? This is L of W, right? Then you do the same thing for L of P, right? You just take P by itself, run it through the function. So here, this thing, and I don't know, it takes you, I'm gonna, I'll make it up. Maybe it takes you over here, L of P, right? And now the idea with additivity is if additivity holds, what I should be able to do is now add these together, right? Add these outputs together. And where should that take you? And you should be able to get this location, right? It'll take you to the same spot, right? So again, it's the same similar idea. The order of operations doesn't matter. If you had gone here and you add the inputs together, then run it through the function, it's the same thing as if you had ran each individual input through the function by itself first, then add the result or sum the result together, okay? So if both additivity and homogeneity check out for this function L, then this is known as a linear transformation or a linear mapping, okay? Let's take a look at a, a couple of concrete examples of this. All right, so let's take a look at a couple of examples. So let's look at this example function here, I'm just calling f. So in this case, this function f, um, what it does is it actually maps from a two element vector to another two element vector. And the way it does this is, right, you give it a vector x1, x2, okay? What this thing does, all this function does is, you can see it sort of flips the order of the inputs. So the first output is actually the second input, but it's scaled up by pi. And the second output is actually the first input, but scaled by a constant three, right? So that's all this thing does. This function here, right? Again, you give it x1 and x2, it flips the order and does a little bit of scaling, a little bit of multiplication on these elements. So you see, you give it a two element vector, you get out a two element vector. So this is what the function looks like. That's what the transformation does, right? It transforms an input vector x into some other input vector y, or sorry, some output vector y, Right, and now we're just asking ourselves: Is this function f linear? Is it? Uh, is this transformation linear? So all we got to do is we got to check those two properties. We got to check homogeneity and we got to check additivity. So let's do the first thing with homogeneity, right? So let's do one version of it, right? We need to check and compute what is f of alpha x. So in other words, we take the input x um, here, we scale it by alpha first before running it through the function, right? So that's what we're doing here. So you can expand that and we can say, okay, alpha times x, it's just alpha times a vector x1, x2, right? Well, you know how a scalar alpha multiplies by a vector, right? We can just move that alpha into each element of the vector. So that's what we're doing here. So again, this is all the operations on the input before we even think about running it through the function, right? Now that we have this, we can run it through the function f. And we know all that function f does is it switches the order of the inputs and then multiplies by pi and 3. So that's all we're doing here. You can see we've switched the order of the inputs here, multiply by pi and 3, okay? So this is what happens if you scale the input by alpha first and then run it through the function. Let's check the other half of, of homogeneity, right? I need to just run the input through the function first and then scale by alpha, right? So that's all I'm doing right here. Again, same thing. You can see here, I'm just going to expand the definition of x. So we know x is just an x1 and an x2. And now I leave that by itself and run it through the function f. And all that function f does is it, again, flips the order of them and multiplies by pi and 3, okay? 
Now I take that output, right? This is the output image or the output space, and I scale it up by alpha. And again, I know how to scale or uh, multiply alpha into a vector. I just move that into each element of the, of the vector. And lo and behold, both these are the same thing, right? You get the exact same answer. It doesn't matter if you scale the input by alpha, then run it through the function, or just take the input, run it through the function, then scale by alpha, right? Both of them give you the same answer, okay? So that's, that's half the battle. The next thing we've got to do is we've got to check additivity, right? I've got to check if I take two inputs, a W and a P, add them together first, then run it through the function, what do I get? So again, same idea, all right? You end up with this. Then I've got to check, okay, what if I run W through the function by itself, then run P through the function by itself, and then combine the, the result? So again, you can see down here in this line, that's exactly what I'm doing. It's a little bit more tedious. Again, I'm taking W by itself, running it through the function, which does the flipping and the scaling. I take P by itself, run it through the function, which does the flipping and the scaling, add the two together, and again, lo and behold, they check out. You get the exact same answer. It doesn't matter the order of operations. You get the same thing. So both homogeneity and additivity pass, right? So we can basically say that, yes, this function is linear, right? Great, okay? Let's look at another, at another example, okay? So example two. Very similar idea where I'm going to still give you a vector, a two element vector, an x1 and x2 as an input to the function. But now let's say this thing does something different. Instead, it just takes the first element, multiplies by the second element, right? So it just jams the two together using multiplication. So now in this case, we've got a two element vector going in. You just got a one element vector or a scalar coming out, right? And all you do, the way this function operates is it just multiplies the two, um, the first input with the second input, right? It just multiplies them together. So again, ask the same question, is this linear? So again, let's go through this, let's check homogeneity. So let's start off with f of alpha x. So I'm gonna scale up the input x by a factor of alpha, and then run it through the function. So again, here it is. Um, you multiply alpha by the input, you get this, okay? And now I'm gonna run this through the, fu through the function f. And all this function f does is it takes the first element, multiplies by the second element. So you see we end up with what? It's alpha squared times x1 times x2, right? That's what this thing does, okay? Now, let's ask what happens if we do it the other way? What if we first run x through the function by itself, then try to scale by alpha, <clears throat> okay? So here we go. Um, running x through the function by itself. Again, all it does is it multiplies the first element by the second element. So that's where we get x1 times x2. And now we scale that result by alpha. And we end up with this. And now look at this, you see, uh-oh, these do not check out. These are not the same, right? So in this case, I don't even need to check additivity because I can answer right away. Since it failed homogeneity, we know this thing is not linear, okay? All right, let's look at one more interesting example. How about a simple equation of a line, right? You would think, oh yeah, uh, duh, this is uh, y equals mx plus b. You learned this in like fifth grade, right? That this is the equation of a line, right? How can this possibly be not linear? Well, again, let's just go through our rigorous analysis, right? We said, here's the function f. You give me a number, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug it into my equation of a line, right? y equals mx plus b, okay? Let's ask ourselves, is this thing linear? Let's check homogeneity, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and scale the input x by alpha, then run it through the function, right? So all you get here is all the, you know, here's the scaled input, it's alpha times x, then I multiply by a slope, add a y-intercept, right? That's all I'm doing here, okay? So you end up with m alpha x plus b, right? Okay, fine. Let's try this now. What happens if I just run x through the function by itself, then multiply by alpha, right? Well, f of x by itself, that's just mx plus b, right? And then I'm going to multiply the whole thing by alpha. Now, you end up with this. And aha, this is what's actually fascinating. Look at this. Again, these are not the same. So interestingly, this is actually not linear. How crazy is that? The equation of a line is not linear. <laughs> um, and again, this is because this is our math. Ma this is a strict definition of linear. This here is, well, actually, I guess it's linear in some cases, right? It's linear if b is zero. If there was no y-intercept, this would actually check out and it would be linear. You could check additivity and you could see it'd be the same thing. It would be fine if, if b was zero. So interestingly, if we, maybe we should write this down, right? Um, with b not equal to zero, this thing is not linear. 
Sometimes this is more commonly referred to as an, what's known as an affine transformation or an affine function, which is basically a linear transformation plus uh, a translation or an offset, which is exactly what this is, right? If this was gone, we'd be fine, but we have this translation or this offset, so this is actually more uh, properly referred to as an affine transformation because we can see it fails the linearity check, okay? All right, um, let's look at two more interesting cases. All right, so this example four is actually one that's going to be very popular and we're going to use it quite a lot in the future. So this is the operation of just uh, a matrix multiplication, right? So now you've got some vector X, you're going to operate on it by some um, matrix A. Is this operation linear? So again, you can go ahead and check homogeneity and I think you all figured out how this works by now. You'll see you get the same answer no matter what. So homogeneity passes and actually, so does additivity. And again, here's the information and uh, the, the, the written out steps on the board. I think I'm gonna skip over it just in the interest of time. So you'll see that, yeah, matrix multiplication is actually uh, perfectly linear. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Let's look at example number five. How about instead of just normal, just you know, multiplies and moving around transposes and things like that, let's look at what about things like a, like a, like a more complicated operator, like maybe like taking the derivative of a function. So now x is not just a you know a, a vector or a scalar number, but what if this is some kind of function, right? And the transformation I want to consider now is you pass this function in as an input, and I want to take its derivative with respect to an independent variable, usually like time or something like that. Is this operation linear? So again, all we got to do is run through homogeneity and additivity. So homogeneity just says, okay, I take the function here, I'm going to scale it up by alpha, and then run it through my operator, which is just a derivative operator. And now, this is where we can uh, maybe benefit by just writing this out. We see that, okay, now I scale the input by alpha and then run it through the derivative operator. And now we know how derivatives work, right? If this constant a is not a function of time, it can come outside of the derivative operator, right? So in this case, right, we see that the, the alpha pops out of the derivative, derivative, we're ending up with this, which is the same thing we get if we just run the function through the derivative and then multiply by alpha. So this derivative actually passes uh, homogeneity, right? So a standard derivative is, passes homogeneity. How about additivity? Same thing. We go ahead and take two functions, w and p, add them together, then run it through, through the derivative operator. And again, we see that because this derivative operator, we know how it works, we see that I can distribute this derivative operator to take the derivative of w, then add it to the derivative of p, right? which is the same thing as this bottom part of the additivity check. So again, this is what's interesting. So the derivative operator is linear. We're going to combine that in effect with the fact that a multiple, the matrix multiplication is also linear. We're going to use this later. Okay. So all of this discussion on linearity maybe brings up another concept that's somewhat very closely related, and that's the idea of superposition or linear superposition. So the idea with superposition is um, if you have some system, right, where you have some inputs u and it generates outputs y, right, so that's what this function f does, right, a lot of times it's said that this function f is, um, if it's linear, it actually behaves and superposition holds. So what superposition means, it's basically additivity and homogeneity, right? What it means is that I can take some input to the function u, if I scale it by alpha and then run it through the function, I get the same thing as if I had just run the function u or the input u through the function, then scale by alpha. And then same thing, we see that the additivity is, is similar for systems that, that obey uh, superposition, right? Or where superposition holds. It says that you can basically take two separate inputs, add them together, and then run it through the function. You get the same answer as if you had gone ahead and run each individual input in together one at a time, and then add the results. So where this is helpful now, and where this is gonna be useful, and we're gonna look at this in just a second is, what if we look at both homogeneity and additivity at the same time for linear systems or for systems that, that where superposition holds? In other words, what that's going to tell us now is, okay, I'm going to take two inputs, u, uh, u1 and u2. I'm going to scale either one of these by alpha and beta, right? And then I have this over here. You can think about, and let me highlight this maybe in green here, right? This is like, you can think about as like a complex input right? You've got some complex input, and I want to now understand what is the output of this system, right? How does the system behave to this complex input? Well, one thing I could do is I could then run it through the function, right? 
and just figure it out. But what superposition tells me is actually, you know what? An even better way to go about this is I don't need to worry about how the system responds to this complex input. Instead, what I can look at is this, right? And if you look at this, right, this is what superposition says. This here is a simple or like a basic input, right? And here's another basic or simple input. So what I could do is if I know the solutions of how a system responds to these simple inputs, I can actually arbitrarily scale either one of these inputs, add them together in any fashion. And in fact, I don't have to just do this twice. I could add a third term or a fourth term or a fifth term or n terms, right? And get the response of a complex input by looking at the response due to these simple inputs, due to linear combinations of these simple inputs, right? So that's what's so great. If this function f is linear, or if this transformation is linear, then superposition holds, and I can basically look at building up more complicated responses of systems in response to simple inputs, okay? So, that, I think, is a good spot to leave this idea of the mathematical idea of just, you know, what is a linear transformation. How does that relate now to linear systems? All right, so now when we're talking about linear systems, a lot of times what we're really talking about um, in this context, especially in the context of uh, dynamical systems or control systems, is we're really talking about linear ordinary differential equations. So the idea is, right, you have some system which has some inputs U and some outputs, I don't know, let's call this Y, right? And a lot of times this model here of how the input output relates is using a set of ordinary differential equations, okay? Now, what I want to look at now is what happens if we're able to tack on this adjective of linear ordinary differential equations, right? So a linear ordinary differential equation looks something like this, right? It's some nth derivative of the signal of interest plus some other, you know, some constant times the n minus one derivative plus yada yada plus, you know, all the way down to, you know, a constant term here is maybe equal to some forcing function or maybe two forcing functions or maybe multiple or like derivatives of the forcing function. So anyway, you've got a autonomous or a homogeneous part plus a forcing or a particular part of this, right? And we're going to talk a lot about this later down the road, but I want to look at why is this maybe called a linear ordinary differential equation and what are the consequences of that, right? So what we can do is let's look at this. Um, let's rewrite the left hand side as a function of z variable. So what I want to do by that uh, is let's call this term here, let's call this maybe z1, right? And let's call this term right here, this first derivative of the signal is like z2. All the way up to, let's see, this guy we're going to call uh, what is this, Zn, and then I think you end up with Zn plus 1, right? And what's interesting is, again, you can see that all these Zs, they're just related to the signal through derivatives. And again, keep in the back of your mind, right, we just looked at how the derivative is a linear operator, right? So now, well, we can rewrite this left-hand side with basically just replacing all of these x's and x dots and x n minus 1 dots, you know, all those derivatives with just these z's, right? So you end up with this expression. It's the same thing. I just rewrote it using z's. Now you stare at this long enough and you see, hey, I can rewrite this as sort of a matrix expression where let me uh, um, pull out all of these coefficients here, right? So this is a big matrix, I don't know, let's call this thing eta or something like that, right? Then you come up over here and you stack all of these signals of interest or states, so to speak, into another vector. I don't know, let's call this maybe z, right? Now, if you look at this thing long enough, right, don't we now have basically the left-hand side is basically, it's a matrix multiplication, right? It looks just like that, right? So again, remember, we said we saw it. the matrix multiplication was a linear operator. Derivatives were all linear operators. So this entire left-hand side, this is a linear operator, a linear transformation, or a linear system, right? So what's great about that is uh, we can now do things like bring superposition into play. So let's look at an example of just, you know, the left-hand side. So I've got x double dot plus 5x dot plus 6x is equal to 0, right? So again, we are going to talk a little bit more. We've got dedicated videos talking about solving ordinary differential equations. But if you watch those or if you know how these things work, you know that one fundamental solution of this is basically by looking at the roots of this characteristic equation. I think this admits two roots, like an R1 is negative 2 and an R2 is like negative 3. Those are, those are roots of this polynomial, right? So one solution is e to the negative 2t or e to the negative root 1t, right? Another solution is e to the negative r2t, right? Or e to the negative 3t. So if you plug either one of these into the differential equation above, right? You basically take this answer, you take its second derivative, right? 
Then you take its first derivative, multiply by five, then you take the thing itself, multiply by six, you do all this algebra, you end up with zero, right? The same thing happens for down here. You plug in this actual value into this differential equation, you'll also get zero, so it's also a solution. And now, because this overall system is a linear system, superposition comes to play, and, and we can now build up solutions of, I can basically take a, um, the first solution, scale it by an arbitrary scalar, and add it to the second solution scale by another arbitrary scalar, and this also is a solution. So you're able to see, we can take these simple solutions and start building up more complicated solutions based on them, and it will all satisfy the original system, right? So this is great because this is basically gonna be a framework that's gonna allow us to build a lot of tooling on top of these linear systems, right? And again, you can do something very similar for the uh, right-hand side if you want if you want to look at if it's linear in the controls as well what you're going to end up is at the end of the day the system if you can write this as x dot of t is equal to some matrix a x of t right that's basically what we just did over here right on the left hand side plus then the components due to the inputs or the forcing functions this is sort of taking into account all of this stuff that i a little did, did a little bit of hand waving over on the right hand side right but if you write it like this, this is a linear system or a linear ODE or a state space representation. All of these are the same words. They all talk about the same thing. And if this is the case, the nice thing about these situations is that we now have a whole bunch of mathematical infrastructure, tooling, proofs, guarantees, um, closed form solutions to these type of systems. So linearity buys us a lot of stuff. And again, we saw that it all stems and it all flows from this idea of a linear transformation where you just need to satisfy homogeneity and additivity, right? Um, we're going to see there are plenty of other scenarios where maybe you can't model your system like this. Maybe you don't have a linear system. And in that case, unfortunately, a lot of things fall apart, right? We're not able to calculate analytical closed form solutions. We have to run to numerical techniques to attempt to solve these systems or attempt to simulate them. Um, but again, that's, I think, what makes this whole world somewhat, you know, interesting and rich, right? Is that the whole world of ordinary differential equations or partial differential equations, right, is quite large, but in this tiny little slice of it, right, if we're able to look at just linear versions of these, um, a lot of things and a lot of possibilities open up. So that's the topic of discussion for a lot of future videos. Um, I think this is probably a good spot to leave the discussion on linear transformations and linear systems. So uh, with that, maybe I think I'll take this moment to say, uh, please, if you enjoyed the video, take a moment and uh, hit that subscribe button. Uh, it really does help me continue making these videos. And remember, they come out every Monday. So I hope we'll be able to catch you at a future discussion and we can all learn something new together. So until then, I think I'll sign off. Talk to you later. Bye.